Harry's Wife, Part 91.14 In Your Face Video Analysis Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, and you join me for another video analysis. I know that you find these extremely useful with regard to increasing your understanding of narcissism and allowing you to gain further insight into the behaviours of Harry's wife. The clip that I'm going to analyse is taken from an interview between Reuben J., a young man who interviews Harry's wife at the mid-season premiere, whatever one of those is, for Suits, the cable show that Harry's wife once was a part of. Mr. J interviews her in the sort of red carpet area. Obviously, there are other people being interviewed around him. And he conducts a roughly five minute or so interview with Harry's wife. I understand that the interview took place around about 2015 2016. It provides us again with a very useful opportunity to dissect her behaviours so that you can understand them through the prism of narcissism. As I've explained before, but it bears repeating. When we have established, as a consequence of a scrutiny of behaviours over a sustained period of time, that an individual is a narcissist, we are then able to interpret that person's behaviour thereafter through that relevant prism. Narcissists and non-narcissists can engage in similar behaviours, but the driving force behind those behaviours is different dependent upon the type of person. As you know, when it comes to any interaction relating to other people, the narcissist behaviour is driven by the prime aims, the pursuit of fuel, control, character traits and residual benefits. That is the engine at the heart of the narcissist. Where you're dealing with an aware narcissist such as myself, I know why I do the things that I do. I know that I'm doing them for the pursuit of the prime aims. Where you're dealing with an unaware narcissist, which is the majority of narcissists, they don't realise that they're doing it for the prime aims. They believe they're doing it for something else, because the narcissism convinces them, tells them, through feelings and thoughts, that the things that they are doing are for this reason, masking the fact that it's actually for the prime aims. Non-narcissists are driven by other motivating factors, invariably covered by emotional empathy or, in some instances, the erosion of that emotional empathy, so narcissistic behaviours come to the fore. The driving forces are different, and it's very important to understand that distinction. By analysing this video, we again are able to look at Harry's wife's behaviour through the prism of her established narcissism so that we can explain to you precisely what is going on. Let us move now into the interview. All right, it's Ruben Jay here at the USA Network premiere for season, the mid-season premiere of, of Suits, right. for season five, uh, with Meghan Markle. Actually, it's not your card, that's for Rick. I don't need a card for you. Please, we'll use the Rick card. Halting at 12 seconds, just in the short opening to the interview, we have a range of behaviors already being exhibited by Harry's wife. The interview commences with Harry's wife staring at Mr. J. She then turns to the camera, again exhibiting her uncanny knack of always seeking it out. Of course, here it's far easier because it's right next to them. But rather than looking at the person who's interviewing her, as one would do ordinarily with a conversation, she has to turn to the camera and stare straight down it. Because, of course, it all has to be about her. She then turns back to Mr. J in order to focus attention upon him and a smile starts to form. Mr. J makes a slight fluff of his lines where he starts saying that it's the season premiere and then corrects himself to explain that it's the mid-season premiere. And immediately Harry's wife interjects with a that's right to confirm. You'll notice that straight after she says this that there's a clenching of the jaw and she stares at him. He doesn't notice this because he's a little bit embarrassed and is looking downwards. But that's a reaction from Harry's wife to him fluffing the description. She, in her world, is uber-important. 
and therefore the fact that he has got the title of the event incorrect is challenge fuel to her. She's being fueled by the consequence that he's engaging with her, talking about her and the show, but the fact that he inadvertently fluffed the title of the event challenges her. And we see that instinctive response of her narcissism to that challenge, the clenching of the jaw, and then staring at him as the narcissism causes her to assert control. In the instant... She's not going to get him in a headlock and start pulling his nose, saying, get it right, you stupid interviewer. Facade management prevents that. She isn't going to turn to the cameraman and go, who's this doofus then, as an indirect assertion of control, by triangulating Reuben J with the cameraman. And therefore, the indirect assertion of control isn't available. And instead, the narcissism causes her to stay in a position where... In effect, she withdraws from the interaction. Although she's still there physically, she withdraws because in her mind, she's no doubt thinking, this guy's an ass clown. And that's why we see the clenching of the jaw and the stare. Because the narcissism has caused her to think a dark thought about him. And there is a consequential physical reaction. Because Harry's wife isn't always that good. Because her narcissism hasn't evolved that far to covering up the consequential physical response to the thoughts that are going through her head. The narcissism allows her to assert control by basically dissing Mr. J in her head. He then comments that he doesn't need a card for you, and immediately Harry's wife jumps in, lack of boundary recognition, by saying, we'll use the cards. Already, after just 12 seconds, she's dictating to Mr. J how the interview should go ahead which demonstrates, of course, her sense of entitlement, her lack of boundary recognition, a lack of accountability for her behaviours, and the necessity of the assertion of control. And we use a Rick card, so, so, uh, (laughs) well, I gotta ask you, because you're obviously, you play uh, Rachel, who's who's, uh, Mike's love interest in the show. Right. Who did it? Who turned him in? I don't know. How do you not know? Of course I know, but I can't tell you. You can, can, you can tell me off camera. Like no. Off no, and here's the thing. People think they want to know, but no one wants a spoiler. Yeah, you don't want to it be like... It takes all the fun yeah, out of exactly. it, right? Exactly. So I think what's been so re- so interesting is, like, as a person, I read the script before we shoot it, and I call the creator Aaron. I'm like, what? And I, yeah. I read it like a viewer, and then I have to take a step back and read it as Rachel would, right? And, like, her experience of it. I tell you my guess? Pausing at 50 seconds... Immediately, Harry's wife intrudes on the situation by trying to look at the cards which are being held by Reuben J. Lack of boundary recognition. You'll notice that she's grinning, and then he asks, he points out, "You play Rachel," and immediately the smile drops, and instead we get the intense stare. Notice there isn't a sort of gradual melting away of the smile, but it immediately disappears, and is replaced by this intense stare at him. That's indicative of the compartmentalization that the narcissism operates through. That there isn't a natural progression of emotions generated from a position of emotional empathy, but because they are manufactured by the selection by the narcissism, it's a little bit like trying on the expression rather than generating it naturally. It is as if she's holding up, mask with a smile, mask with a frown, mask with an explanation, uh, exclamation of disbelief. And that rather than morphing from one to the other in a natural segue, what actually happens is the expression just boom appears and then zoop, it's gone. And then boom, the next one appears and then zoop, it's gone. And so you see that, that there is a natural smile which forms and then it immediately disappears because the narcissism determines at that point there's no need for it. And it doesn't melt away, it just rapidly vanishes. Mr. Rubin poses a question about something that happens in the show, asking who did it. And, after a moment's pause, Harry's wife explains that she doesn't know. And then she says, well, of course I know, but I can't tell you. Notice that her voice is suddenly raised. She is probably two feet away, mouth-to-mouth, from Mr. J at this point. 
yet she has to raise her voice, which again is a boundary transgression. She then launches into a short explanation, commencing with, here's the thing. You'll notice at this point just how close she actually is to Mr. J. Now, of course, it is only right to point out that the area that they're studying is not exactly one that's providing with a huge amount of room. You see that there's somebody stood immediately behind Harry's wife. The lady's hair comes into shot at one point, and therefore they clearly don't have a huge amount of room to be stood a few metres apart from one another. But nevertheless, Harry's wife is right up in the face of Reuben J. And as she provides this explanation about what's going on as she reads the script, you'll notice that she's engaging in her customary arm-waving, being demonstrative and gesticulating right in front of him. Her proximity is very close to him, exhibiting an absence of boundary recognition. Similarly, her actions, as we've seen many times before, are almost disproportionate, too loud, too demonstrative, and that shows that her narcissism is somewhat glitching, as her reactions aren't natural, but are rather created by her narcissism as it attempts to work out what the most appropriate response is in this situation. You'll also notice in the explanation that she talks about the fact that she calls the creator, noting that she feels that she's able to call the creator and go, what? In terms of what's happened in the script, sense of entitlement, lack of accountability. I mean, who, who is it? Yeah. I think it's Scott. Okay. And and my reasoning is, and tell me if this makes sense to you. Tell me. Is obviously Harvey chose Mike over Scott. So Scott is going to take the one thing that obviously is more important to her, for, for, to Harvey, and take it away from her. That's my thought process. Okay. And according to uh, to Gina, I'm way off. So I don't. I think you're pretty off. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, no. Anna, <laughs> but it's a really good guess. The I think logic it's, it's makes good sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. The uh, logic that's works. what I would have gone with. Pausing at one minute and twenty-three seconds, the exchange continues, and. Mr. J then provides us with his observations as to who he thinks is the one that's done it. Notice that as he talks, Harry's wife's left hand is poised. You can see as her fingers move that she's absolutely itching to touch him, grab him, prod him. As, once again, Harry's wife engages in the customary assertion of control through physical contact. We've seen it repeatedly in the way that she grabs at Prince Harry, pushes her hand onto the small of his back, guides him, directs him, always asserting that control. And we noticed it, of course, during the engagement interview with the Grip of Doom. Here, her narcissism, always needing to assert control, is looking to cause this through physical control of Mr. J., she doesn't quite get there, but she's still stood particularly close to him. As he talks, she also maintains the fixed stare. It's unnatural and intrusive, again, showing that there is a lack of congruity between the way that she acts and the situation. It's intrusive, showing a lack of boundary recognition. She exhorts, tell me. That, again, is the assertion of control. She then cocks her head to the right, almost coquettishly, slightly flirtatiously, and she stands there with the fixed stare and her mouth hanging open as if she's going to run her tongue across her teeth in a salacious and inviting manner. The tilt of the head, the fixed stare, the way that her mouth hangs, all put you in mind of what? A predator sizing up its prey, which is precisely what's going on. And it looks as if she's actually going to try and sexually seduce him, which, of course, in, effect, in a way, she is seeking to seduce him. Because, as part of the initial interaction between the two, I don't know if they particularly know one another, I'll assume that they don't, he's a tertiary source to her. But she has to bring him under control, and she will do so through a form of seduction. Now, that doesn't mean that she's going to start kissing him and put her hand down his pants and have a rummage, but rather, she has to behave in a way to draw him in. That's a form of seduction, but a non-sexual version. So, being friendly to somebody, being charming and funny is how a narcissist would seduce somebody, but not in a sexual way. 
and do it with friends and family members, for instance. Here, again, because of the glitching that her narcissism engages in, we actually see that she's almost behaving in a sexual manner towards him. He offers up his suggestions as to who's done it, and she then immediately says, I think you're pretty off, which is an insult and an assertion of control. But then we get the fake laugh, as if to make light of the put-down that she's just issued. Mr. J looks slightly uncomfortable and embarrassed, and she engages in the false laugh that we've heard many times before, before she then follows up with flattery, with a compliment saying, it's a pretty good guess, which again is a form of assertion of control. I will continue this video analysis, which provides us with further intriguing observations with regard to the dynamic and behaviours of Harry's wife in part 91.15. Join me there.